Hello everyone and welcome to the 8th Hammer tutorial in the version 2 series. This tutorial will apply to all Source Engine games. I'll be using Portal 2 authoring tools to complete this tutorial. Today we will be doing a complete overview and implementation of lighting. To start things off, I just want to discuss the compile process and some theory on lighting. So the compile process that actually compiles the lighting in your level is VRAD. Seen here in the compile step, you have normal off and fast as well as this HDR checkbox. For the purposes of this tutorial we're going to stop using this compiler and we're going to start using the expert compiler which I'll go over configuration for that later in this tutorial. When VRAD runs, assuming there are no leaks in your level, having a leak will cause an issue with radiosity or bouncing light. So you'll need to make sure you have zero leaks before you compile with lighting. When RAD runs it will generate light maps lighting, create ambient sampling, and also generate per object or per vertex prop static and detail prop lighting. Generally speaking, VRAD is the slowest compile process, assuming that VVIS isn't slower because your level is improperly optimized. There's really no way to speed up VRAD other than light map optimization. Now I'd just like to go over some brief theory of color and light design in your level. When you initially add a light to your map, it will be 255, 255, 255, 200. This is in red, green, blue intensity. Intensity is actually how strong the light will be broadcasted in your level. But the all 255s mean that it is pure white. Now no light ever is just white. You'll find that most lights in the real world have a yellow or blue tint to them. Even as you look around now, you'll probably notice that the light in your room is a yellowish light to it or your computer monitors when they cast light on the wall behind you they're blue now but that doesn't mean that you can't have other colors in your levels you're going to use colors a lot to increase the immersion of your map and to give the player a set feeling that you'll want them to have during that part of your map yellow and greenish lights um, when the player stumbles upon them, it makes them feel like they're accomplished or they're comfortable, depending on the situation that you want the player to have. It's also a stealthy color. It makes the player more aware and more careful of their surroundings. It also gives them a feeling that the room could be alive, if that's what you're going for, almost like a greenhouse or forest type area. Blue and purple are colors of sadness. It really makes the player think about what they're doing. You can use it when you want them to sympathize with someone or you want to make them really think about their actions. But you need to be careful when you use the blue and purple mindset with this because it can make the player second guess too much and they may second guess themselves right out of the correct solution. Red and orange make the player feel like they need to rush, like the room is about to explode. This is great if you want to build suspense or make the player feel like they need to get out of somewhere really fast and it even helps if you put enemies in the way. So even while they're trying to defeat the enemies, they're still rushing through the levels. It's a great feeling and really good gameplay. A bright outside area, or just a bright area that's generally lit, this will be like with a slight yellow tint to it. The player usually doesn't think too much, it's just kind of mellow lighting. It's lighting because it has to be lit. This is what you'll use when you want the player to really focus on a story that an NPC is telling, or you need them to pay attention to something. Black and Darkness is a very important part of all levels and just everything. You can't show light in a level without having dark because dark is just the absence of light. So you need the dark to show the light. It's great for scary maps or if you want the player to feel a large sense of insecurity or uncertainty. Don't use it too much because the player typically doesn't have fun when they're in a dark area because they're uncertain of what's going to happen. It's great for certain parts. Again, just don't overdo it. When the player finishes a dark portion, you need to put them into light so they feel like they've accomplished something, that they've completed the darkness and, you know, they're home free. It makes them feel really good. Even games like Amnesia, The Dark Descent, that have the horror and darkness down to a science, they have bright areas that almost act like a safe haven for the player. There's a lot more that you can read on lighting psychology as well as giving the player emotions depending on what you want them to feel for your level. I'll include some links in the description below so you guys can read more upon it. I just don't want to go too in depth when we're really here to learn about Hammer. Now we're going to actually implement lighting into our level. We're going to start with just a basic light and then we're going to go from there into more advanced topics. 
The map that I'm working with today is a modified level from the seventh tutorial. I just have a small house built onto the back of it so we can add some lighting to it. We're going to start by going into a room and we're going to put a light bulb on the ceiling here. We're going to start by pressing Shift E and place in a new entity and then changing it to a prop static. It's very important that when you want to have a light, you need to have an actual source. Search for light in your filter in your model browser and then find a model that you will like. I'm going to find this one. In the models tutorial, we discussed the different tabs. And the one we're interested in now is skins. And we'll see that there's two skins, one for off and one for on. I'm going to select the on skin and then place my model on the ceiling where I want it to go. Once the model's in a place that I like, I'm going to copy it down with a shift drag just to create a new entity and then press alt enter for object properties and change it to light. Once it's a light and we click apply we'll see that we have a little light bulb. Go ahead and place this underneath your model. You don't want the light to be too close to the ceiling otherwise it will create undesired effect. There will be a really bright light shining from right there which we don't want. The solution to this is actually just to pull the light down a little bit so it doesn't cast as brightly. You'll learn how far you need to move your light down away from the model for whatever situation you're in. It all comes with time, but even now, even though I've been doing this for eight years, I still go back and adjust my lighting sometimes. It's nothing that you have to worry about. I'm going to double click on the light to bring up the object properties now. And let's look at the options that we have for the light entity. The main one we're worried about now, since we're just implementing a very basic light, is brightness. We're going to choose pick color to choose the color of our light. I want the color of this light to actually match up with the color of the model. So I'm going to use the color picker to choose that. Once I have a color I think I'm happy with, I'm going to click OK and apply. We'll see that the light has been tinted the color that we've selected. And we have the RGB value of that color right here, as well as a preview of the color in the box. The last color is brightness or intensity. This is how strong the light is actually cast. You can see here from these screenshots that each different shot is at a different brightness that increments. 50 each time. There's a big difference from the light that has 50 brightness to the light that has 200 brightness. You'll learn the brightness that you want and for whatever effect you want to have in your level. I'm going to set this to 150. We're now going to compile our level so we can see the light and how it looks. I'm going to use the standard compiler with the HDR box checked. Now that we're in our level, we can see that the light is being cast from this light as well as the HDR effects which we'll be able to fine tweak later in this tutorial. We're now going to take a look at another lighting entity called the light spot. This will be the entity that we'll use to create a spotlight effect in our level. Once again we're going to start by creating a static prop and finding the correct light model for this. Here's one that will work. They're work lights. Again there's two skins. We're going to choose the on one. And now with them in a place that I think I want them to be at, I'm going to create a new entity and make this a light underscore spot. Click apply and we'll see that we get a small little blue spotlight model. When we drag it out of the ground we'll see we have a cone. This is the cone that will show us where the light is going to be cast. I'm going to simply start by just rotating this light into place. I'm going to turn snap to grid off as turning snap to grid off is okay if you're working with detail. Once the light's in place where I want it to be I'm going to select it and we're going to color it. We're going to choose brightness. I'm going to choose a color that matches the light. Once that color is selected, we'll see that the cone has been tinted that color. I'm going to change the brightness of these lights to 600, as these lights are typically brighter than normal lighting. We also have Brightness HDR. Brightness HDR, if you don't change it, uses the normal brightness settings. But if you're compiling with HDR and you've changed these, it will use this setting instead of brightness. Typically, you just leave this alone. You'll use this for more advanced things, or if your light in an HDR compile is typically too bright, that's when you'll change this. We're now going to change our inner and outer fading angles. These are the radiuses of these cones. So down here we're going to select outer. We're actually going to increase this to 60. As I turn that number up, we'll see the cone got wider. And the inside one is a little bit more rounded. It's a fade from this inner cone to the outside one. And any light from this inside one will be very bright. This is how a spotlight actually works. So we have fine control over what we want this light to look like. I'm going to change the inner angle to 20. We'll see that it got a little smaller. I'm actually going to point this light down some. Now I'm going to shift drag this light over and put it into place on the other model. I'm now going to compile the level really quick so we can see what this looks like. Now inside of our level, 
we can see that those two lights working together are casting a spotlight effect towards this wall. We see that the light behind us isn't actually being cast. This light has been generated from radiosity bounces from the surrounding textures emitted from these lights. We're now going to take a look at how to light our outside and add a sun. This is very easy and requires two entities to work together. We're going to press shift E and create a new entity. This is going to become a light underscore environment. When we create this entity, we'll see we have a little sun. We now want to decide where our light should be cast from. I'm going to choose to have our light cast from up here in this corner. The easiest way that I've discovered to get the angles down is to control X to put your light environment on your clipboard and then paste it in your 3D view where you want the light to be cast from. Then put your camera in position and then look at the angle that you want the light to be cast at. Press Alt Enter to bring up the object properties and select Pitch Yaw Roll. Click Point At and your cursor will change to a crosshair. Click somewhere in your 3D view and that's where the light will be cast. Now press Ctrl X again to put it back on your clipboard and we're going to put this with our global entities. This is just best practices so you can keep all of your entities that affect the entire level together in one area. Now we just need to choose the color. We're going to select brightness and pick a yellow, orangish color. Again, the entity will be tinted the color that we've chosen. With the desired color chosen, I'm going to increase the brightness to 350. Now light from a light environment is only cast from a skybox. So you have to use the skybox texture to get light to be cast from this entity. We also see that we have a new value here called ambient. This is ambient lighting that's actually everywhere. Typically this will be a dark blue color and at very low brightnesses to look correct. If you don't quite understand what it looks like, simply just set this to red and give it a really high value and you'll see exactly what it does. I'm going to change mine to blue and give it 20 as its brightness. We'll see we also have brightness HDR and ambient HDR as well as brightness and ambient scale HDR. This will just simply scale the value of HDR. Typically one is good enough. We're going to leave it at that. We also now have sun spread angle. This is how soft the shadows that are cast from this entity will be. I like three. You'll want to set it to about five and turn it up or down depending on the effect that you want for your level. I'm going to click apply and then close out of this. We now need to create the sprite in the sky that will actually act as the sun. To do this, select the light environment and just shift drag it over. We essentially do this not only because it's faster, but because we need to retain the angles that are inside this entity. We're now going to change the class to NV Sun and click Apply. There's two things that we'll want to change in here. The first one being Use Angles, we're going to select Yes. And the other one is Size, which I'm going to change to 24. And then click Apply. I'm now going to compile the level so we can see what this looks like. Here we are in game, and we see that we have our shadows being cast from the sun. The shadow down here, as well as the rest of the lighting. When we look into the sky, we don't see a sun. This isn't because you did something wrong. This is because Portal 2 simply doesn't support it with the sky. I can verify that it actually exists and we did it right by no clipping out of the map. And I, when I look at the sun, I can see that it actually is there. If you do this in, say, Counter-Strike Source or Global Offense or Team Fortress 2, the sun will actually be there in your sky. We're now going to add sprites to our level. Sprites add a super cool effect on the lighting that will make it look more realistic and convincing in your level. I'm going to do this by copying this light to a new room. With the light in its new home, we're going to create a new entity, and this is going to be a NV sprite. When we click this, we'll get a little black box around it. This is completely normal, and we just have to change a few settings to fix it. We're going to put the sprite inside of the light model. Now with it actually inside of the model, we need to change a few key values to get it to function properly. The first one we're going to change is render mode. There will be three render modes that you'll actually use, which are glow, additive, and world space glow. Glow will always take up the same amount of pixels on your screen, no matter how far or close you are. This is good for an effect if you want the player to notice something across the room, because it will be bigger when they're far away, but smaller when they get close. It also will always render in front of a prop. Additive renders in the 3D world no matter where it is, so it will render through a prop. World Space Glow acts like additive and glow together almost, whereas it will always render on top of a prop, but it's the same size in the 3D world. We're going to change this to World Space Glow and click Apply. We'll see that the glow changes around the light to how it should look. We're going to change the FX color or the actual color of the light to that of the light being cast. So we're just going to select our light entity and copy the RGB values. We're now going to paste it into FX RGB. Click apply and you won't notice any changes. The other thing we want to change is the scale. The scale of this is going to be 0.6. 
When you do this, it'll typically get bigger. For some reason, the default value is smaller. As long as we're on the topic of effect lighting, we're also going to take a look at the custom effects that can be placed on a light. We're going to do this once again by copying this light to a different room. Once in this different room, we're going to click on the object properties of the light and look at appearance and custom appearance. Under appearance, it's always set to normal by default, but you can change this. These are the preset appearances that change how the light is rendered. I'm going to change this to fluorescent flicker. You also have a custom appearance where you can make an effect that you want of your own, where A is total darkness and Z is fully bright. They also give you an example of a steppy fade from dark to light. There are examples on the light entity entry on the VDC. I'll include a link to that in the description below. We're now going to compile our level and see our new addition. At our first light here, we can see the glow around the light itself. This adds a very nice effect that I actually like a lot. Now going to come over here to our flickering light. And there it is, there's the fluorescent flicker. Typically you'll want to have the skin change with the light. This will be done with inputs and outputs that we'll cover in a different tutorial. Now we'll want to create an effect on our light spots. This effect will be use a point spotlight and it will create a volumetric appearance and a bright glow when you look at it head on. This is a really cool effect that you'll want to use quite a bit when you use these type of lights. We're going to start by selecting both of our light spots, hit Ctrl C to copy them, and then Ctrl Shift V to paste special. This will create a copy of them exactly in the same spot. We're going to press Alt Enter for the object properties and change the class to point underscore spotlight. When we click apply, you'll notice that they've flipped the direction that they're going on the Z axis. This is a really simple fix. Select both of them and then change the pitch yaw roll and remove the negative sign in front of the first value. Click apply and it will fix the angles. Now we need to set the color for both of them the same way we did the sprite in the previous section. So copy the RGB value from the light spot and then paste it into the color in the RGB section. Now we want to move this entity back closer to our spotlight model. Holding the alt key I'm able to completely unlock this entity from the grid getting it in the perfect position. You will only ever want to use the alt key to unlock something from grid when you're doing very meticulous detail work. You can cause problems if you do this incorrectly with brushes so I urge you to do this with caution. Now with both of them in place where I want them to be I'm going to press alt enter and we're going to look at the length and width of these effects. The length is how long this effect will be. It doesn't really tell you how long. I believe it's in units. I'm going to set mine to 650. This is often a value that I will tweak a lot to get the desired effect. The width, I'm going to make 60. Again, this is a value that I will tweak to get the effect that I want. The only other value that I really change a lot is the FX amount. I'm going to change this to 220 instead of 255. It will just decrease how much it's rendered by just a little bit. This value also is on the and the sprite effect and it does the exact same thing it turns down how strong it is we're going to click apply and then cancel and compile our level and see our new changes now inside our level when we round the corner we see that there is this glow that is now being drawn from our point spotlights when we face them head on there is a bright glow like if we're looking into a spotlight itself this is a super cool effect that you'll use quite a bit the width is a little bit too much, but like I said, we'll end up tweaking those values quite a bit to get the desired effect that we want. The next thing we're going to add are dust motes. Dust motes are particles that you typically see from a light on a bright sunny day. They're little dust particles that float up and down in your light. This is really easy to add. We're going to start by choosing a new texture and searching for trigger. You'll see orange texture with trigger written on it. Select it, and I'm going to create a 64 by 64 block around my light. Once in place, I'm going to double click it to bring up the object properties and then press Ctrl T to tie to an entity. I'm going to then change it to a Funk Dust Motes. And we'll now want to change the particle color to something of a golden yellow. And there's a few other settings that we'll want to change. We can choose particles per second. This is how many particles will spawn per second. I'm going to change this to 25. The speed of the particles, this should typically be slow. I'm going to set mine to 7. The lifespan of the particles, or how long they stay alive before they fade out and fade back in. I'm going to set their lifetime a little bit longer than the default values. I'm going to make them be 5 and 7. The maximum visible distance. This is how close you need to be to see these particles. If I'm outside of 1024, these particles will not be drawn to me. Frozen means that it spawns the particles immediately and then shuts off. You typically won't change this. 
Minimum particle size, I believe it should be a little bit smaller than 10, so I'm going to set it to 5 and the maximum to 12. Lastly, I'm going to change the alpha to 180. Click apply and then close that out. Do note that certain Source Engine games, although they will support this entity, are missing the texture. You'll need to port this texture over to get it to work. The only game that I can confirm that doesn't have this texture by default is Portal 2. I've ported it over for the purposes of this tutorial. I'm going to now compile the level so we can see our changes. Now as we get closer to our light, we can see the Dustmo particles spawning and slowly fading away and dying. You'll notice that the speed of them is random depending on a per particle basis. And as we slowly get further away from them, they'll die off because I'm too far away for them to be drawn. This is an optimization purpose and you should typically leave it as 1024 because you don't want particles to be rendered when you're 4,000 feet away from them. Now we're going to add an NV projected texture to our level. This is the dynamic light that you see ever so popular in Portal 2. Do note that if you're using Counter-Strike Global Offense, the light environment uses an NV projected texture to cast those oh so beautiful shadows on the ground. This means that you cannot use an NV projected texture in your level as there is a hard limit of one active at any given time in every source game. With mods, you are able to change this limit. This is why in Gary's mod, you're able to have more than one light active at a time. Implementation of this entity is very simple. We're going to come over to this room, create a new entity, and make it a NV projected texture. Once it's applied, we'll get the same cone type deal as we did with our light spot. I'm just going to use pitch all roll and point at to have it go over in the corner. You'll see that when we have it selected, we have this large cone. You also may notice that it turns purple at times. This is just a glitch with hammer and you don't need to worry about it. In the object properties, there's a few things that we'll want to change. The first of all being enable shadows. This is off by default. We want yes. If you do not turn this to yes, no shadows will be cast from this light, defeating its purpose. We're also going to take a look at flag. Every entity has flags that affect how the entity is run in your level. There will be two that we'll use for this entity. Always update means that it's moving light or parented to something. We'll cover parenting in a later tutorial. Enabled means that this light starts enabled. We're going to leave that checked. Always update unchecked for the purposes of this tutorial. Under class info, we're going to change the field of view. This is how wide the texture is being cast. I'm going to change this to 60. Now we see near Z and far Z. These are the clipping restrictions of this entity. If I change the far Z to a value greater than 750, we'll see this purple cone extend further. This is how far the light will be cast. Light will cut off after this cone and will no longer be cast. We have near Z that does the exact same thing except for where the light starts to be casted. If I change this to say 30, we'll see that the shaded area has moved forward. This is good if you're keeping your light inside of a model so you don't have weird lighting artifacts. We now have brightness scale, light color, and texture name. We're going to start by changing our light color. I'm going to do blue. I'm now going to change the brightness of this light to 2500. For some reason, the NV projected texture operates under different intensity guidelines as that of normal light. You'll want to play with this value to get something that you want. The brightness scale affects the scale of how bright the light should be. I'm going to set this to 3. Again, this is an entity that you will troubleshoot many times to get the desired effect that you want. Now, under texture name, we're allowed to change what texture this is broadcasting. This can cast any texture that we want. Typically, you'll leave it as default, which is flashlight 001. In Portal 2, there's other effects such as Flashlight 02 and 03. If your game does not have the texture name, you'll need to add it in Smart Edit. So to do this, we'll uncheck the Smart Edit box up top, and we'll see that I already have texture name added. If you don't have it, click the Add button, and under Key, put texture name, and under Value, put the path to the texture that you'd like to use. Otherwise, if you have this here, you can just use the Browse. I'm going to click Apply and close out of this. So I can also verify that the dynamic shadows are working. I'm going to create a dynamic prop here that has an animation to it. Now I'm going to compile our level so we can see what this looks like in game. Now looking at our envy projected texture, we can see that the shadow is being cast dynamically behind it. If I go into third person, we can see that I also have a shadow that's being casted from this light. You'll also notice that this light does not project light bounces, as does the light that's compiled by radiosity. This light will actually work if you compile without rad, as it's being rendered in real time by the engine. 
whereas the other lighting information is baked into the light maps. Now we're going to look at some more advanced lighting techniques, such as light map optimization and light map scaling. As I mentioned in the first segment of this, VRAD computes on a light map basis. We can view the light maps by clicking camera and selecting light map grid. This will then show us all the luxels that are compiled to light. The Envy projected texture doesn't need RAD to compile because it doesn't use these at all. It's computed in real time and casts dynamic shadows, whereas everything else uses these little squares or luxels to compute lighting. This lighting is static and cannot change once it has been compiled and baked into the level, but we are able to change these. Pressing Shift A to open the face edit sheet, we can select a texture and we'll see light map scale is defaultly set to 16. Typically you'll leave this alone as this is a really good starting value for your light maps. Certain things though, you may want to be sharper or less sharp. For the purposes of this tutorial, I'm going to make this floor sharper than this floor so we can see the comparison on these windows. I'm going to set it to 4 instead of 16. When I change that, you'll see that there are a lot more luxels now for VRAD to compute lighting. This means longer compile times and more memory for the map. Do not do this too much as it will increase compile times drastically. We can also see that I've applied some light map scale optimization to these spheres to make them more detailed and none to these. I'll show you guys the differences in these when we compile and look in game. Now as I mentioned before, some things do not need as sharp of shadowing, such as this back wall here. Since it's just outside and there's really no light being cast on it, I can increase this object's light map scale to 32 or even 64 and no one will know the difference because light isn't being cast on it. It's all one shade anyways. So now, even though I've added a lot more, I've removed some from this face. I'm now going to compile a level so we can see what this looks like in-game. Now we're in-game. If you've ever loaded your map and it's full bright like this, like there's no lighting, but you know you've just compiled with lighting, it's a simple fix. You can either restart the game or press the tilde key to open your console, type mat underscore full bright zero. This will bring all the lighting back into your level. You'll need to do this if you load a map up that doesn't have lighting and then go to a map with lighting, or if you've done a lighting list compile and then do a lighting compile afterwards. And we'll see that these shadows are decently sharp, and when we come out here, these are a lot blockier and more blurry. You can see the direct contrast here between the two. Even where the light map scale changes, which is right here, you can see the change in lighting goes from very blurry to sharper. You can also look at here on these cylinders that I've changed the lighting at. You can see that the lighting is actually smoother with the lower light map scale on the spherical object, whereas the lighting on these, which have a 16 light map luxel scale, looks a lot more jagged. There's another technique we can use to actually make this smoother, and this is called smoothing groups, which we'll go over later in this tutorial. Now we're going to look at casting light from a brush. This is done with a rad file. We're going to view our RAD file by opening up my computer and then browsing to our Steam Apps location and going to our game's respective folder. Mine is Portal 2 and Update is where my content is stored. We're now looking for lights.rad. You can simply open this with a text editor. I'm using Notepad++. Inside this text editor, we'll see a few entries for lights followed by RGB and intensity values. These correspond to a texture and that texture when applied to a brush will now emit this light color at this intensity. We're going to modify one of these to do what we want. We're going to modify lights slash light panel cool. Normally this is a cool blue light. We're going to change it to be an ugly green. First we want to add it to our level though. We'll see that's just a white texture. I'm going to apply it over in the spike pit over here. Now with it applied, it will automatically cast the light referenced in that rad file. But like I said, you're going to turn it green, so I'm going to change it to and then we'll save it. Now it will automatically cast light from the light map luxels. That's how it knows where to emit light from. So if we look at our light map grid, we'll see that there's this amount of luxels on it and it casts this much across. If we change the light map scale to say four, it's now going to emit a lot more light from this brush. I'm going to leave it as 16 and we're now going to compile our level and see how it looks. We're now in our level and we look over here we have this horrendously ugly green being cast from this bar. So if you want to add your own entry simply just add texture name and then RGBI. For example if I wanted to do the dev textures I could do dev slash dev blend 
0.01. If I wanted it to emit red, I would put 255, 0, 0, 300. And now this dev blend 01 texture will now emit this lighting. We're now going to look at smoothing groups. The best way to show smoothing groups is to make two new cylinders. Now, for smoothing groups to work, there are a few restraints and restrictions that you'll have to make sure are met before you can apply a smoothing group. All of the faces must share a common edge. So the common edge for these are right here. So these are already okay on that rule. The light map faces must be aligned to each other. If we go to the light map grid, you see that they're not quite aligned to each other. So we're going to select them all that we're going to use in the smoothing group. So holding control, I'm going to select these outside faces and then click face and that should work. Now, the light map scale must be small enough that at least one light map luxel can fit on each face. We can already see that there are plenty of full luxels on each face, but I'm actually going to want a smoother effect on this, so I'm going to turn down the light map scale to 8. I'm also going to do this to this other brush as well. This other brush here is for sheer contrast of a non-smooth cylinder compared to a smooth one. And lastly, all of the faces must be in the same smoothing group. So, to add them to a smoothing group, bring up the face edge sheet once more with Shift A, select the faces that you want to be in said smoothing group, and then click Smoothing Groups in the bottom right. We'll now get the Smoothing Groups dialog, which is just 24 smooth groups and 8 hard groups. Now, the 8 hard groups are told to never be smooth. The smooth groups are told to always be smooth. I'm going to click 1 and we'll see that 1 is depressed. Do note that faces can be in multiple smoothing groups at the same time. If you'd like to view what objects are in what smoothing group, you can hit camera and change the smoothing groups. Now when I click 1, this brush and its faces are highlighted in yellow because they are in the one smoothing group. I'm going to change back to 3D textured and compile our level and see how it looks in game. Now, looking at these two cylinders, you may not notice too much different. But when we look at the sides here, we can see that this one has a smoother transition over than this one. This is because all of these faces are treated as one when the compile is happening, giving it a much smoother lighting effect. This should be done whenever you use a rounded object. It only adds compile time to VRAD and does not infect map performance. We're now going to look at some other advanced compile settings that we can use on our light and light spot entities. These are blending options. So going back to our light with the dust motes, I'm going to double click to select it, and we'll see constant, linear, and quadratic. Constant, linear, and quadratic are the three blending modes that we can use. By default, all lights are 100% quadratic. You can blend these together to give different lighting effects depending on the situation that you want. Constant will cast light to the ends of the earth, as demonstrated by this screenshot here. While linear is a linear fade off until the light is no more. Quadratic is bright towards the center, and then has an exponential fall off. I like linear lights to fall off with a brighter center, so I'm going to blend this to be 3 fourths linear and 1 fourth quadratic, as indicated by this screenshot here. You can see how this looks. There's also 3 fourths linear and 1 fourth constant. This will give me a smoother, brighter fade off in the middle, but the light will be cast to the ends of the earth very slightly. This is very good for ambient lighting in a Portal 2 test chamber. This is where I use this effect the most. We'll also see 50% fall off and 0% fall off distance. When we click these, we have the option for a camera button. We position our 3D camera a distance away from the light and click the button. We'll automatically put in that value. We're going to back up a little bit more, select the 0% and click that one too. When we click apply, we'll get two spheres surrounding our light. The distance from the light to the first sphere is 100% to 50% fading. The second sphere to the outer sphere is 50% to 0%. If these are set to any number other than 0, your blending options are automatically null and void. I prefer the blending options because they give me more control over the, how the light should look. Sometimes you'll have a prop that's casting incorrect shadows, or shadows that just don't look right. This is most likely because Source Engine is casting these shadows based on the collision model and not the textures. There's a few things we have to do to get Source Engine to sample the textures and the model's polygons instead of the collision model. We're going to demonstrate this with a tree model, as this is where it's mostly used. We're going to select Prop Static and choose World Model. I'm going to use a tree model that's from Episode 2 that's been ported over. We're going to put this into place in our level. And now we're going to compile 
to see how the shadows will normally look. The shadows will be compiled based off of this yellow collision model. We want to change it and tell it to use the polygons of the model instead of this collision model. We now look and we'll see just a line being drawn from this tree. That's because it's using the collision model, which is not what we want at all. So let's look back to Hammer, and there's a few things we need to do to get this to work right. First, we need to revisit our rad file. We need to tell it to sample the textures of this model instead of just the polygons to get the correct shadowing information. So going back to Steam Apps, Common, in my case Portal 2, and Update, I'm going to open my lights.rad file and scroll down to the bottom. I already had these entries added for this tree model. All you'll need to do is add force texture shadow, space, and then the path to the model, which can be found here under world model. This will tell the compile process to sample this model's textures and their alpha instead of just the static prop polygons. We still need to tell it to sample those things in the compile process first. That is just one of the steps that we need. We're now going to hit run map and then we're going to switch to the big boy compiler or expert. We're going to click the edit button at the top and create a custom compile option. We're going to select full compile LDR only and click copy. We're going to name this something that we're going to refer to as our final compile. This is what you'll use when you're done compiling a level. Click close and from the configurations drop down select it. We'll see we have five compile steps here. BSP, viz, light, copy, and game. This last one launches the game after it's done compiling, which I never do, so I'm going to click remove to remove that one. You can keep it if you'd like. We'll see lighting, and we're going to click new. This will create a new compile step. Under light, copy dollar sign light underscore exe, and paste it into the new command. Move this up to be under the light command that already exists. Select everything in the parameters box, and copy it. I'm going to open it in notepad plus plus, so we can dissect what's here. There are a few commands. Texture shadows, which is what the force texture shadow command in the light files did. It tells it to sample the textures alpha when casting shadows using static prop polys. Now, static prop polys is what tells VRAD to use the model's polygons instead of its collision model when computing shadows for this model. Static prop lighting is what tells the engine to bake the lighting per vertex into the static prop. This is used in every final compile that you should ever do. Sometimes you may get weird artifacts when you do a compile like this. So to fix that, on the model that you're getting strange shadows on, select it and go to disable vertex lighting and select yes. If you're still getting strange shadows, disable self shadowing. Back to our compile options, we're now going to add dash final to this. Final is a switch that tells VRAD to compile better lighting from a light environment when casting rays from. So now under our final compile good, we're going to paste that there so we've appended final to it. Under our new lighting one, we're going to paste it once more and change LDR to HDR. There's a switch called dash both, which will compile LDR and HDR lighting. It will be recommended by some people, but I personally do not recommend it as I have seen it cause issues in the past. I enable both of these, so there's the checkboxes by it. Now it will do a final full compile when I click go. But here's a little trick that I've picked up on the side. You can use a switch called threads to limit the amount of CPU that these compile process can take. So you can still map or watch videos while your computer compiles. To add this switch, simply type dash threads and then however many threads you want the computer to use. I have an i7 with eight threads, so I'm going to give it six. I'm going to apply this to my viz and both of my light compile process. And now I'm going to click go, and we'll see our final compile. Now in our level, we see that we now have full shadows from our tree here. I've lowered the light map scale on this floor so I can get a little bit sharper shadows from it. And now we also have a little bit better lighting from our light environment being cast because of that final switch. You may also want to tweak your HDR settings in your level. HDR is that dynamic exposure that when you go from dark to light, it blinds you for a short amount of time and then your eyes adjust. This happens in real life when you wake up in the morning and it's bright out. It hurts, but then your eyes adjust to it and everything seems to level out. We need a few entities to be able to tweak this. We're going to go over to our area with our global controllers. 
and create a new entity. This is going to be an NV Tone Mapper. The NV Tone Map controller, once created and placed anywhere in your level, will affect the HDR settings that you tell it to use. We're going to give it a name of Tone Mapper, and that's it. We're now going to compile our level once again, and we're going to find the baseline settings that we want to use for this map. Now with our Tone Mapper inside of our level, we're going to fire a few commands to it via the console to be able to modify our dynamic settings in real time. You can see even now when I look around, when I look at the ground, it will get a little bit brighter, and then when I look at the sky, you can see it fade down and get a bit darker. These are the settings that we're going to affect right now. We're going to open our console and type ENT fire. This will allow us to fire an output directly into our NV Tone Mapper from our console. This will allow us to tweak it in real time without having to compile after each minuscule change. I want to very minimally get into inputs and outputs in this tutorial as I want to go over it in more detail at a later time on how it works. So just for now, just carbon copy this verbatim and tweak the numbers to your liking. So ENT fire and then select Tone Mapper and hit the down arrow to autocomplete. It will give us an option of all of the commands that we can fire to it. The first one that we're going to set is set auto exposure min. This is the minimum that it's set to. Just to show you guys exactly what we're affecting, I'm going to set this to an outrageously high value just so it overexposes the screen. We can now see that it has massively overexposed everything and it looks really terrible. We're now going to set this to a value that I think I would enjoy. I'm going to set it to 2. And if you're unsure of what the value is that you've set it to, set both the min and the max to the same value. So auto exposure max to 2, and this is exactly what 2 is. I think the minimum that it should be is a little bit darker than this, so I'm going to try 1 for the max and 1 for the min. We'll see it goes down some more, probably some more tweaking needs to be done. So auto exposure min, I'm going to try 0.4 set the max to the same so I can see what that is exactly. So this is the minimum that it will be. Probably a little too dark, but just for this it's fine. I'm now going to write that down on a notepad file so I don't forget it. I now want to choose the maximum exposure that this can be. I think the maximum exposure should probably be 1.5 and I'm going to set the min to that as well just so I can see what that is. So this is the max. It's a little bright and kind of hurts a little bit. This is about what it should be, and it'll balance off. So the max is getting set to 1.5. And the other option that we're going to fire is the exposure rate. Set tone map rate is how fast it will transition from brightest to darkest. I'm going to set the tone map rate to 0.2. Look down. You'll see it gets brighter much slower now. And now when I look up, it also fades down much quicker. I actually like 0.2 for this value, so I'm going to set the rate to 0.2. Now we just need to add these commands to the game, so that way they're fired when the map loads. So with these tucked away over here, we're going to come back to Hammer and create one last entity in our global controller. We're going to change this to a Logic Auto. I'll go into more detail on what a Logic Auto does, but the gist of it for now is it's going to fire an output when the map spawns. We're going to click Add, and we'll get a new box. This is all under the Outputs tab on the Object Properties. Under My Output Name, we're going to choose On Map Spawn. We're going to select the eyedropper and click Tone Map Controller. This will target the Tone Map Controller. We're going to click the drop-down, and it will give us all the possible inputs that we can give it. Under Set Auto Exposure Max, we're going to set the max to 1.5. We're now going to highlight this output, click Copy, and then Paste to add it again. We're going to change Max to Min and set it to 0.4. Click Apply, copy and paste it one last time, and change it to Tone Map Rate, and then set it to 0.2. There are other options that you can configure on your Tone Mapper, but I'll let you explore those on your own. You can find out more information on what those outputs do by clicking the Help button on the Object Properties and scrolling down to Inputs, as well as looking at the Valve Developer Community entry for this entity. We're now going to compile the level and do a brief once-over on the entire map so we can go over what we've covered today. 
We're now in game, and we have our light being cast from our light environment, as well as our tree shadows from our final compile settings. Our two cylinders, one smoothing grouped and one not. Our ugly green bar light. As I said before, the sun does not work in Portal 2, but it works in other games. Our light map comparison of 16 to 4. A standard light entity with a model. Our NV projected texture with an animated model dancing in front of it. Please also remember, once again, that if you're in global offense, you will not be able to use this if you have a light environment, as there is a hard limit of one NV projected texture on at a time, and global offense takes us up using the light environment. Come over here to our dust motes with our light and its sprite around it. Our light shafts and our glows from our point spotlights as well as our light that is freaking out due to its custom appearance of a fluorescent flicker. I hope this tutorial helped you get a better understanding of lighting in the Source engine. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions feel free to shoot me an email as that is the best method to get a question answered not the comments. Once again if you have a question that you want answered, email to me is the best place to reach me and not the comments. Thanks for watching once again. Don't forget to subscribe and happy mapping.